I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. As Press Secretary Jen Psaki's time winds down at the White House, she admitted Thursday that she would miss the back and forth she had with Fox News correspondent Peter Ducey. Psaki and Ducey clashed many times during her tenure as Press Secretary. Take a look back at some of the more memorable moments. I understand that the science says that vaccines prevent death, but I'm triple vaxxed, still got COVID. You're triple vaxxed, still got COVID. Why is the president still referring to this as a pandemic of the unvaccinated? Well, I, I think, Peter, there's a significant difference between, and you just you just experienced this, and not to expose your public health experience, but I can speak to mo mine as well. I had been triple vaxxed. I had minor symptoms. There is a huge difference between that and being unvaccinated. You are 17 times more likely to go to the hospital if you're not vaccinated, 20 times more likely to die. And those are significant, serious statistics. So yes, the impact uh, for people who are unvaccinated is far more dire than those who are vaccinated. Will the president update his <laughs> language at some time to be more reflective of the fact that people who are triple vaccinated are catching and spreading COVID. I think the president has said, as have we a number of times, that there will be breakthrough cases. There will be people who get COVID uh, here uh, at different media organizations, at companies around the world, uh, around the country, uh, who have been vaccinated. But there is a significant difference between being hospitalized or dying and uh, being vaccinated with more mild symptoms. And then last one, you crime to follow up on what Ed was asking about. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that the most important job for any president is to keep Americans safe? I would agree. So you said that the president's never satisfied if people don't feel safe. Does he know that after a year in office, people do not feel safe in this country? Well, Peter, I think if we look at the facts here, we've seen a surge of crime over the last two years. Would you agree with that? So what are you attributing the rise in crime to then? Well, I think we should be responsible in how we're reporting to the public what the, what the, what the uh, roles are, what the reasons for the surge in crime. Gun violence is a huge reason for the surge in crime. Uh, underfunding of pol some police departments and their need for additional resources, something the president has advocated for consistently through the course of his career. That's something we know we need to take action on. And it is absolutely true that he will not be satisfied uh, or complacent when officers are being gunned down or when Americans have to worry about whether they can safely ride the subway or bus. That should not be a political issue. He's somebody who has had a long career of many decades of fighting for uh, funding for police departments for local communities in order to reduce crime. But he's been here in office for more than a year, and the murder rate is nearing a 25-year high. So why don't we see and hear more from the president about this? We hear all the time about things that you guys are doing to fight the pandemic because that is a risk to American people. A rising murder rate is a risk to American people too, right? And he has spoken to crime. But I think what people are most uh, uh, focused on, as they should be, are what actions he has taken. He has unveiled a strategy to focus federal law enforcement resources on combating vi uh, violent crime, offered unprecedented levels of funding through the rescue plan for cities and states to put more cops on the beat, and invest in uh, proven community anti-violence programs, something every Republican voted against. The Department of Justice has announced $139 million in grants to cities for community policing, which will put 1,000 more officers on the streets. He's also proposed doubling those grants, and he's called for an additional $750 million for federal law enforcement. He's announced a zero tolerance policy for gun dealers who sell willfully, uh, willfully sell illegal guns. And we've launched gun trafficking strike forces in New York and cities across the country. Actions are important here, and he has a long record of them. But does the president think that any of that is working? The president thinks you should have a plan to address crime and gun violence. He has one, and we look forward to working with people who support that effort. But as the murder rate nears a 25-year high, would he consider maybe trying something different? Trying something other than uh, supporting a massive plus-up in funding from his predecessor, cracking down on gun trafficking and gun violence, which is a major driver of the violence we've seen across the country, working to support community policing programs and police departments across the country. I think most people who want to fight crime would agree that's the right approach. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. On schools in Virginia, seven districts representing 350,000 students are suing the state. They're hoping to get a strict mask mandate for students that has been rolled back by the new governor. 
reinstated. So who does the president think knows best for students, school board members or parents? Well, the, parent, the, the president believes that uh, public health officials have the best guidance on what we can all do to protect ourselves including teachers, administrators, and students. It's always been up to local school districts to determine how they're going to approach uh, what implementation measures they're going to put in place. But here's what we know from public health officials who are the experts on a pandemic. Uh, studies show that masks reduce transmissions in school. They are a proven tool that helps keep students and teachers safe from COVID, and they can thus help keep schools open and safe. In short, we know it works, and we need every leader to focus on using the tactics we know work to keep our students safe and our schools open. I know you mentioned Virginia, but in Texas, uh, the state is fighting a critical public health measure to protect our children and keep our schools safely open for Head Start communities, uh, ones that uh, a, a provision that is requiring masks to keep students and keep uh, communities safe. They're fighting against that. Why is that? I think that has, uh, that has more to do with politics than it does with public health. But right now in Virginia, the law is, now that there's a new governor, but students should not have to wear masks if their parents say that they don't think they need to wear masks. So if a parent wants to send their, school, uh, their kid to school with no mask, should that child be allowed to go to school and be in class? Again, uh, we're, what we're advising school districts on is to abide by public health guidelines and follow public health guidelines. And it's about keeping an entire community safe. And those are the decisions that are being, uh, that people should focus on making. And just so that it's crystal clear for anybody watching, you guys think that ultimately in this conflict between school board members and parents, the school board members should have more of a say in what, what it's a That's actually child not what I said. I think everybody should abide by public health guidelines, not just to keep their own kids safe, but keep their, their school community safe, whether it's teachers, classmates, uh, administrators, others in schools. Okay. Thank you, Jen. It sounds like you guys are blaming Putin for the increase in gas prices recently, but weren't gas prices going up anyway because of post-pandemic supply chain issues? Well, I, I think there's no question that, as we have seen, and outside analysts have conveyed this as well, the increase in the anticipated continued increase, which is, I think, what some of your colleagues were asking about, that that is a, a direct result of uh, the invasion of Ukraine. And also, there was an anticipation of that uh, that, was, that uh, was, uh, was factored in as gas prices have gone up. So you say that you're going to do everything that you can to reduce the impact that high gas prices have on Americans. Uh, we're asking other countries to think about maybe pumping more oil. Why not just do it here? Well, to be very clear, federal policies are not Im uh, limiting the supplies of oil and gas. To the con let me finish. To the con let me finish. An executive order his Peter, first week that I'm halted new oil and le gas. Let me let me give you let me give you the facts here, and I know that can be inconvenient, but I think they're important in this moment. To the contrary, we have uh, the, we have been clear that in the short term, supply must keep up with the demand. Where we are, and here and around the world, will we make the shift to a secure, clear, clean energy future? We are one of the largest producers with a strong domestic oil and gas industry. We have actually produced more oil. It is at record numbers, and we will continue to produce more oil. There are 9,000 approved drilling permits that are not being used. So the suggestion that we are not allowing companies to drill is inaccurate. The suggestion that that is what is hindering or preventing gas prices to come down is inaccurate. Would President Biden rescind his executive order that halts new oil and natural gas leases on public lands? Well, 90 percent of them happen on private lands, as I'm sure you know, and there are 9,000 unused approved drilling permits. So I would suggest you ask the oil companies why they're not using those if there's a desire to drill more. Would President Biden ever undo his executive order that stopped the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline? Are you suggesting that would solve the gas prices issue? Well, do you think that that would maybe affect prices faster than getting the whole country off of fossil fuels? I actually don't think it would. Uh, the Keystone uh, was not an oil field. It's a pipeline. Yeah. Also, the oil is continuing to flow in just through other means. So it actually would have nothing to do with the current supply imbalance. So gas prices are approaching an all-time high per gallon. 
how high would they have to get before President Biden would say, I'm going to set aside my ambitious climate goals and just increase domestic oil production, get the producers to drill more here, and we can address the fossil fuel future later? Well, again, Peter, the U.S. produced more oil this past year than in President Trump's first year. Next year, according to the Department of Energy, we will produce more oil than ever than ever before. Those are those are the facts in terms of oil production. And again, right now there are 9,000 unused approved permits to drill on shore. So I think you're misidentifying what the actual issue is. But if we're looking to the future and what how what we can do to prevent this from being a challenge in future crises, the best thing we can do is reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and foreign oil uh, because that will help us uh, have a, a reliable source of energy so that we're not worried about gas prices going up because of the whims of a foreign dictator. Right. And you guys think that asking Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or Iran is reducing our dependence on foreign oil? That's actually, I just outlined each of those specific scenarios and the range of par discussions that we're having uh, with each of those countries. I don't think anybody is advocating for Iran to continue acquiring a nuclear weapon, perhaps except for the former president who put, pulled us out of the deal. Go ahead. Uh, president Zelensky spoke with ABC today. He says that he's had a long-standing request in with allies uh, to access these Soviet-era fighters. Thank you, Jen. We just heard you say again that you think inflation is going to be temporary. We've heard you say that it was going to be temporary since last spring. So how long do you guys think temporary is? Well, again, Peter, I think what we do is we rely on the assessments of the Federal Reserve and of outside economic analysts who give an assessment of how long it will last. The expectations and their assessment at this point continues to be that it will moderate by the end of the year. There's also no question that when a foreign dictator invades a foreign country, and when that foreign dictator is the head of a country that is the third largest supplier of oil in the in the world, that that is going to have an impact, and it is. And so to that point, inflation goes up today. The president's statement blames the Putin price hike. Are you guys just going to start blaming Putin for everything until the midterms? Well, we've seen the price of gas go up at least 75 cents since President Putin lined up troops on the border of Ukraine. And, and last month, the statement didn't mention the Putin price hike. It mentioned inflation because of the pandemic. Why is that? Well, Peter, last year, last two years, there was a pan global pandemic. Everyone who's a uh, global economist have all agreed that that has been the biggest contributor to date of inflation because of the impact on the supply chain. Obviously, global events impact the economy, the global economy, as well as global inflation. And the uh, price hikes as a result that have ex escalated over the course of time of President Putin's further invasion of uh, the impact on the global oil markets are, of course, having an impact. Uh, President Biden has hosted electric vehicle stakeholders here at the White House. Would he host oil and gas producers, the people who are the most affected by the Putin price hike? Well, the oil and gas, I have nothing to preview or predict for you in terms of him hosting uh, oil company executives. Is he open to that? I don't have anything planned on the schedule for that front, but I will tell you that uh, the president has been clear that uh, he believes they have uh, the tools they need, uh, 9,000 unused permits, they have the, uh, the capacity they need to go uh, get more oil here in the United States, and he'd encourage them to do that. Go ahead. Just one yeah. more about electric vehicles. You guys are pushing electric vehicles today. This is a president who always talks about the power of our example. Mm -hmm. Does he own an electric vehicle? Presidents of the United States States don't do a lot of driving. He's posted videos where he's revving the engine of his Corvette in Wilmington. He owns cars. And he also has driven electric vehicles as president, does as he, is to give a model to the rest of the country. Does he own one? I think the president's record on this is clear, Peter. Presidents of the United States, current, and when they are no longer, typically are not doing a lot of driving. Go ahead. Topic. When Title 42 expires next month, what is the plan? For the 18,000 migrants a day that are going to cross, do you want them to get jobs here? Is there something else that you want these 18,000 a day to be doing? I don't know where you're basing your specific numbers on, Peter, but what I would tell you... Uh, I've got it right here. Earlier this week, the department gave reporters an estimate that up to 18,000 
migrants could be apprehended at the border each day if Title 42 were well, being lifted. up, up to, be and we'll see what happens. And obviously, we're taking steps to convey that this is not the time to come. Uh, individuals who come to the border, this is what would happen. CBP and ICE would work together to ensure that anyone who enters the country without authorization is put into immigration proceedings as quickly as possible. CBP has been working with ICE to ensure individuals awaiting processing in the interior of the country monitor under, would be monitored under the alternatives to detention program. We know that to date, nearly 80 percent of non-citizens waiting in the interior under prosecutu prosecutorial discretion have either received a notice to appear or are still within their window to report. That is what would happen. In addition, I would note the Department of Homeland Security also put together a preparedness plan to continue addressing irregular migration that involves surging personnel and resources to the border, improving border processing, implementing mitigation measures, and working with other countries in the hemisphere to manage migration. Those are all steps that they're working to do in order to implement when we get to that point in time. And the last one on this. Now that the Texas governor is saying that he's going to start busing border crossers to Washington, D.C., when they get here, are you guys going to help them find a place to stay and something for them to do? Well, I'm not aware of what authority uh, the governor would be doing that under. I think it's pretty clear this is a publicity stunt. His own uh, office admits that a migrant would need to voluntarily uh, be transported um, and he can't compel them to because, again, enforcement of our country's immigration laws lies with the federal government, well, not a state. Washington, D.C.? Well, listen, I don't know, but I know that the governor of uh, Texas or any state does not have the legal authority to compel anyone to get on a bus. Go ahead. About yesterday, uh, we noticed starting at the end of the campaign and then into the transition and here at the White House, any time that the president has an event where he is given a list of reporters to call on, Fox is the only member of the five network TV pool that has never been on the list in front of the president. And I'm just curious if that is kind of official administration policy. We're here having a conversation, aren't we? Yes, but And do I take questions from you every time you come to the briefing room? Yes, but I'm Has the president the taken president. questions from you since you came in since you he came into office? Unfortunately, yes or no? Only when I have shouted after he goes through his whole list. And the president has been very generous with his time with Fox. I'm just curious about this list that he is given. So the only member of the five network pool never on it, dating back to when he resumed in-person events in Wilmington during the end of the campaign. Well, I would say that I'm always happy to have this conversation with you, even about your awesome socks you're having on today, you wearing today, and have a conversation with you, even when we disagree. The president's taking your questions, and I'm looking forward to doing Fox News Sunday this Sunday for the third time in the last few months. I think we got to move on because we got limited time. Go ahead, Kristen. Jen, thank you. Uh, the president talked about the. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jen. There are Taliban fighters right now carrying American weapons. They're wearing American fatigues, the full kit of gear. How is that advancing America's national security interests? Well, Peter, I think my or my colleague Jake Sullivan spoke to a version of this uh, last week. Um, but let me tell you, uh, let me reiterate some of what he said. Uh, when the president made this decision uh, to bring our men and women home from Afghanistan who were serving. Uh, he knew uh, he made that decision not lightly. He made the decision uh, with a clear assessment from his national security team about what the impacts could be. We have taken steps over the past few months to retrograde materials, to bring materials home, to make them not available uh, to the Taliban. We have taken those steps from our military. But our, uh, our uh, choices at hand, the President's choices at hand, were either to equip the Afghan National Security Forces with the materials and the equipment and the weapons they needed to fight or not. He made the decision to equip them with the weapons to fight. And we will continue to take steps to retrograde our materials and equipment. But uh, does the President have a sense that most of the criticism is not of leaving Afghanistan, it's the way that he has ordered it to happen, by pulling the troops before getting these Americans who are now stranded? Does he have a sense of that? First of all, I think it's irresponsible to say Americans are stranded. They are not. We are committed to bringing Americans who want to come home home. We are in touch with them via phone, via text, via email, via any way that we can possibly reach Americans to get them home if they want to return home. There are no Americans stranded is the White House's official position on what's happening in Afghanistan right I'm now. just calling you out for saying that we are stranding Americans in Afghanistan when I said, when we have been very clear that we are not leaving Americans who want to return home. We are going to bring them home. And I think that's important for the American public to hear and understand. Stand. Okay, and then following up on what somebody asked, Jake, the president likes to say America is back, but 
I, his policies have Americans getting beat up by the Taliban and Afghans handing babies over barbed wire fences. Is that what he meant when he said America is back? What the president meant is that we are going to continue to lead in the world, including being the leaders in evacuating not just our Afghan partners, not just American citizens, but now also our allies. And we have done that by evacuating approximately 42,000 people over the last month. That is Americans leading. That is our men and women in our military leading on the ground, securing the airport after the Afghans fleed and didn't secure the airport, and ensuring that we are taking care of our partners as we promised to. Go ahead. Something tied to an ongoing court case. Why did President Biden suggest that Kyle Rittenhouse on trial in Kenosha is a white supremacist? So, Peter, what I, I'm not going to speak to right now is anything about an ongoing trial, uh, nor the president's past comments. Uh, what I can reiterate for you is the president's uh, view uh, that we shouldn't have, broadly speaking, uh, vigilantes patrolling our communities with assault weapons. We shouldn't have opportunists corrupting peaceful protests by rioting and burning down the communities they claim to represent anywhere in the country. As you know, closing arguments in this particular case, which I'm not speaking to, I'm just making broad comments about his own view. Um, there's an ongoing trial. We're awaiting a verdict. Beyond that, I'm not going to speak to any individuals or this case. But the president has spoken to it already. And his mom now, Kyle Rittenhouse's mom, came out saying that the president defamed her son and that claims, uh, she claims that when the president suggested her son is a white supremacist, he was doing that to win votes. Is that what happened? I just have nothing more to speak to in ongoing case uh, where the closing arguments were just made. Okay. On immigration, has the White House considered beefing up border security now that there is video of a three-year-old and a five-year-old being thrown over the wall in New Mexico? Beefing up border security. I, well, there are, there's video now of a three-year-old and a five-year-old. I've, I've seen the video, and I think any of us who saw the video um, – were incredibly alarmed by uh, the steps of smugglers, ones that we have been quite familiar with, that we've spoken out about our concerns about. As Secretary Mayorka said, the inhumane way smugglers abuse children while profiting off parents' desperation is criminal and morally reprehensible. The president certainly agrees with that. And these kids, I believe, were rescued from, by, uh, by um, individuals who are working at the border. Yes, but they still got close enough as you guys are talking about addressing root causes in the region for a smuggler to throw them over a wall into the desert. And I'm just curious what the White House is doing to stop that from happening. And are you concerned more about the kids' safety or are you concerned about kids getting in? Or tell me more about your concern here. Kids' safety is, as you just mentioned, the main concern. Well, of course it is, which is why I'm often surprised why some of the line of questioning here. But uh, I will say that um, our concern and our focus is on sending a clear message to smuggler to the region that uh, this is not the time to come. You should not send your kids on this treacherous journey. That these smugglers are uh, preying on vulnerabilities in these communities. There's a lot of issues and steps we need to take to address root causes. So of course our concern is for the safety of these kids. These border patrol agents who save these kids deserve our uh, our thanks and our gratitude for ensuring their safety. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. At the tail end of the president's remarks today about cybersecurity. He was asked about Afghanistan, and he made a I think joke. Peter asked him that question. The other Peter did, and he made a joke. So what's so funny? Well, I think the question he was asked, if I remember correctly, was about uh, when he will provide information about a decision on August 31st. I don't want to paraphrase the question. If that was an inaccurate description of the question, to a lot of people watch. Of course, it's a very important question, and I think what he conveyed, uh, what is that. Um, he has not, well, what I can convey from here, I should say, is that uh, as he stated yesterday, and as the Secretary of State just stated, we're on track to complete our mission by August 31st. Obviously, there are discussions, uh, and the President received a briefing just this morning. Uh, as I noted, he asked yesterday for contingency plans, and he received a briefing on them this morning. These are incredibly serious issues, and there are discussions that are happening internally. And I'd note that um, in addition to the contingency uh, plans that he, uh, he requested, he also, I will reiterate, as, as we stated yesterday, that this is all contingent on us achieving our objectives and, our continue, and the continued coordination with the Taliban. And the President has spoken, I would say, to this 
issue. Peter, as you know, you've been attended a number of these multiple times over the last several days. Um, and he has also uh, highlighted the fact that we are closely watching, closely following uh, the threats from ISIS-K, which he also received a briefing on this morning. And his remarks last night, he gave a lot of time to the domestic agenda. Does he think that the Build Back Better plan is as urgent and as time sensitive as this evacuation of Americans and Afghan friendlies from Kabul? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's important to the American people who care deeply about whether they're going to have jobs, whether they're uh, going to have child care, uh, whether they are going, whether we are going to be able to compete uh, with China and countries around the world, to understand that we have to do multiple things at the same time. That's okay. exactly what any president of the United States has to and do. The next one, just as these negotiations about safe passage for Americans and mm -hmm. SIV holders continue, why haven't we heard the president say? The United States does not negotiate with terrorists. Is that still the U.S. policy? Well, of course it is, Peter, but I would also say that uh, there's a reality that the Taliban is currently controlling large swaths of Afghanistan. Uh, that is a reality on the ground. And right now our focus and our priority is getting American citizens evacuated and our Afghan partners evacuated. And I would say, given the numbers that we've outlined and briefed for you, uh, that we've had made a great deal of progress in doing exactly that. Okay. Is the White House rethinking their opposition to new pipeline projects since one really important one goes offline and gas stations start running dry? I wouldn't say we look at it as it, through that prism, Peter. We look at it, we analyze uh, both the impact, the economic impact, as well as the environmental impact. And that will certainly remain the case, but we look at different, each pipeline project uh, individually. And you mentioned that environmental impact. If the solution for this pipeline going offline is for oil producers to start using rail cars and oil tankers as uh, floating storage and uh, for the EPA to start letting gas stations sell lower quality fuel that is not as clean burning. How is the president showing U.S. climate leadership? Well, Peter, I think what the president's trying to do in this moment in time is ensure that uh, the American people know that we're going to work to address this current challenge uh, and that he is going to use uh, all of the assets uh, and resources at his disposal in departments. And you saw that as evidence from what our Secretary of Homeland Security talked about, what our Secretary of Energy talked about to address, to address these current challenges. And he doesn't want people on the East Coast and the Southeast uh, to uh, worry. He doesn't want them to, uh, to uh, he wants them to have an understanding of the fact that the government is all over this and we're working to address it uh, and address their needs as quickly as possible. And quickly on the pandemic. I don't think that they've set for that. Thank, okay. you. Thank you, Jen. Following up on these charter flights that the Taliban is holding up in Afghanistan, the Secretary of State said there are limits to what we can do without personnel on the ground. Yeah. You just said we are not on the ground. You're right. Whose fault is that? I don't think this is about fault here. Well, I'm, I'm convinced. I think what people want to understand is what we're doing to help address it. There's a handful of Americans, and I'm sure you're not suggesting we should have flights with hundreds of people we don't know who they okay. are, where there's How no security Americans protocols. Too few to go in. Too few. I, I just am conveying to you there's a handful of Americans who we are also in touch with, and we are working to help get evacuated from Afghanistan. But decisions you have to make in the federal government are not yes and no decisions or as simple as what you're laying out here. What we're evaluating and looking at is how to keep people on our military bases safe while also getting these U.S. citizens, dual citizens, people who are prepared to let, leave Afghanistan, uh, able to leave. At the same time, we don't think it ha we're not going to allow flights that have hundreds of people who we don't know who they are, who haven't been security protocol through security protocols where we haven't seen the manifest to land on U.S. military bases. Okay, there are now more terrorists wanted by the FBI and the new Afghan government than there are women. Does the president think that is a foreign policy success? Well, first of all, no one in this administration, not the president, nor anyone on the national security team would suggest that the Taliban are respected and valued members of the global community. They have not earned that in any way, and we're not, we have never assessed that. This is a, uh, a caretaker cabinet that does include four former 
imprisoned Taliban fighters. We have not validated that. We have not conveyed we're going to recognize it. What we are working to do, and nor are we rushing to recognition, there's a lot they have to do before that. What we are working to do is to engage with them because they oversee and control Afghanistan right now to get American citizens, uh, legal permanent residents, uh, as SIV applicants out of Afghanistan. But, we have to engage with them. To engage with them, their new acting interior minister is a Haqqani network terrorist. He's wanted for a bombing that killed six people, including an American. He's believed to have participated in cross-border attacks against U.S. troops. There's a $10 million bounty on his head. Why are we engaging? Should we not? Should we not talk to the people who are overseeing Afghanistan and just leave it and not get the rest of the American citizens out? What are you waiting for them to do? They just formed their government. But are you waiting for something? Uh, uh, some waiting for specific? what? You're, you're saying that uh, we're not going to rush to recognition. That means that there could be recognition. As we've said many times, the international community is watching. The United States is watching. It's whether they let people uh, depart the country who want to depart, whether they treat women across the country as they have committed to treat and them, and how they that. behave and operate. And therefore, we're not moving toward recognition. At the same time, we're dealing with a reality world here where we have to engage in order to get American citizens and others out of the country. The president said last night, why did President Biden say he has been to the border? Well, Peter, uh, as you may have seen, there's been uh, reporting that he uh, did drive through the border when he was on the campaign trail in 2008, and he is certainly familiar with the fact, and it stuck with him, with the fact that uh, in El Paso, uh, the border goes right through the center of town. But what the most important thing uh, everyone should know and understand is that the president has worked on these issues throughout his entire career and is well versed in every aspect of our immigration system, including the border. That includes when he was vice president and he went to Mexico and Central America 10 times to address border issues and talk about what we can do to reduce the number of migrants who are coming to the border. He worked in a bipartisan manner with senators like Ted Kennedy, Harry Reid, John McCain, and others to push for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, he does not need a visit to the border to know what a mess was left by the last administration. That's his view. Does that count as a visit? He said, I've been there before. You're saying he drove by for a few minutes. Does that count? What do you? What is the root cause? Where are people coming from who are coming to the border, Peter? The president said that. I'm he asking. Has you, I'm asking you a question because I think people should understand the context. No, you're where do people? Question, where do people? Co I'm asking you. If that okay, counts. I'll answer it for you. People come from Central America and Mexico to go to the border. The president has been to those countries ten times to talk about border issues. There is a focus right now on a photo op. The president does not believe a photo op is the same as solutions. But he said that may be a difference he has with but, Republicans. But that's not what he said either. He said, I guess I should go down. So does he think that he needs a photo op? Is that what he's saying? He, is that he what doesn't. Saying? And that's a fundamental disagreement he has. I would say the former president went to the border at least once, maybe more. You may know the numbers. How did that immigration policy result, Peter? That immigration policy resulted in separating kids from their parents, building a border wall that's feckless and that costs billions of dollars for taxpayers. The president fundamentally disagrees has, on how we need to approach the immigration anything issue. Anything changed at the border between 2008 when he drove by and 2021? Aside from the fact that migrants are still coming to the border through the course of Democratic and Republican presidents, and the uh, the, the need to reform the immigration system is even farther long overdue, no. But we need to work with Democrats and Republicans to get that done. I think we're going to have to keep chugging along here. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jen. First on COVID origins, is the White House worried that China continues stonewalling the World Health Organization investigators and now is saying things like they think maybe COVID-19 got into China through frozen food? We are certainly remain or continue to be concerned, Peter, about uh, misinformation coming from uh, voices in China about certainly the origins, uh, their lack of participation in the process, their lack of willingness to provide data and information to the World Health Organization. As you know, we are undergoing our own uh, process here, our 90-day review here, uh, but certainly uh, the Chinese providing information, being in, uh, a, a participant in the process would aid, aid the effort. And then speaking of misinformation and the announcement from yesterday, for how long has the administration been spying on people's Facebook profiles looking for vaccine misinformation? Well, that was quite a loaded and inaccurate question, um, which inaccurate I would refute. How? 
Well, Peter, first of all, as you know, we're in, we're in a regular touch with with a range of media outlets. As as, as let me finish. As we are as we are in regular touch with social media platforms. This is publicly uh, open information. People sharing information online, just as you are all reporting information on your news stations. But Okay, so these 12 people who you have on a list, 12 individuals, do they know that somebody at the Surgeon General's office is going through their profile? I'm happy to get you the citation of where that comes from. There's no secret list. I will tell you that these are people who are sharing information on public platforms on Facebook, information that is traveling is inaccurate. Our biggest concern here, and I frankly think it should be your biggest concern, is the number of people who are dying around the country because they're getting misinformation that is leading them to not take a vaccine. But Young people, old people, kids, children, this is all being, a lot of them are being impacted by misinformation. The big concern, though, I think for a lot of people on Facebook is that now this is Big Brother watching you. They're more concerned about that than people dying across the country because of a, a pandemic where misinformation is traveling on social media platforms. That feels unlikely to me. If you have the data to back that up, I'm happy okay. to discuss and just it. About things that are on Facebook, I looked this morning. Uh, there are videos of Dr. Fauci from 2020 before anybody had a vaccine, and he is out there saying there's no reason to be walking around with a mask. So, is the administration going to contact Facebook and ask them to take that down? Well, first, I think what Dr. Fauci has said himself, who's been quite public out there, is that science evolves, information evolves, and we make that available in a public way to the American people. Exactly. I, I, I have never seen any data su to suggest that, uh, that the vaccines cause infertility. That is information that is irresponsibly but, traveling. Okay. Sure, uh, just I one think more. Just one more. Sorry. Just one more. Okay. About the science, uh, about the science evolving, Facebook used to post I used to block people from posting that COVID may have originated for a lab. That is something this president now admits is a possibility. So is there any concern that the things you are trying to block or have taken down might someday turn out to be? We don't take anything down. We don't block anything. Facebook and any private sector company makes decisions about what information should be on their platform. Our point is that there is information that is leading to people not taking the vaccine and people are dying as a result. And we have a responsibility as a public health matter to raise that issue. And the responsibility we all have, the government, media, platforms, public messengers, to give accurate information. A mistake in their guide for reopening. By How so? Well, uh, they included advice from the abolitionist teaching network uh, and they came out and said that was not supposed to be in there. Uh, is the administration going to follow up with school districts to make sure that the abolitionist teaching network uh, material is not in lesson plans? Well, just to be clear for the context, because I know you love context of yeah. what you're yeah. asking about here, what you're referring to is a citation in a report of which there were a thousand citations. So I'm quite impressed with your researchers to, for finding one of a thousand citations. Uh, it was an error in a lengthy document to include this citation. Uh, the specific site does not endorse, we, does not rec represent the administration's view, uh, and we don't endorse uh, the recommendations of this group. And I believe it's been removed or is in the process of being removed. But we are close to schools reopening, and is there any concern if you don't endorse this material that was in there, citation or not, uh, that it's in lesson plans? Well, first I would say that, as we've said many times before, uh, we don't dictate or recommend specific curriculum decisions uh, from the federal government. That is and will continue to be handled at the local level, and we believe that the American people trust teachers to make those decisions, not government. And then on masks, a few weeks ago, the president said we were closer than ever to declaring our independence from a deadly virus. Is that still the case if you guys are now reportedly considering asking vaccinated people to wear masks again? Well, first of all, the CDC director who oversees decisions along those lines and all of our public health decisions made clear that that was not a decision that had been made just a few hours ago. So I, I point out that first. Second, I would say what the president was uh, referring to and continues to talk about, as he did last night at a town hall, is that 
we're quite proud of the progress that's been made. Uh, people over 65, more than 80 percent are vaccinated. Almost 70 percent of adults are vaccinated. 162 million Americans uh, are vaccinated. That is certainly progress. But we are still at war with the virus. We've never said that would be over. We've always said that we'd be, be continue to continuing to focus on ensuring we're meeting people where they are and getting them vaccinated, but, keeping them safe. But the president said in May, vaxxed or masked. I is, I think a lot of people got the vaccine because they were hearing him say, if you get the vaccine, you don't have to wear masks anymore. So, And that continues to be CDC guidance. And you can say that that's going to be the guidance forever. I am not the CDC director. I understand, but people don't care who tells them to wear a mask. If they should the care. House, if should, it's the White House. Shouldn't the they care if it's a doctor, a medical saying. expert, or a spokesperson? I think most Americans actually do care. It's the government. Okay. Kelly, go ahead. Is there a conversation about encouraging people to make the personal choice that Dr. Walensky talked about today if they, for example, are vaccinated but live in a state with low vaccination rates or have other considerations? Is part of your messaging going to be encouraging the personal choice piece on mask wearing? Well, that is currently our messaging, right? So I would say that uh, for communities where there are lower rates of vaccination, and, and as we know, that that's really concentrated in only a handful of states across the country where most of the cases are coming from, uh, as we've seen the rise in the Delta variant, which is more transmissible, and if you're not vaccinated, it is transferring, no question, uh, more quickly uh, across people. People should wear masks, and that is something we will continue to encourage uh, leaders and civic leaders and educators uh, and uh, people who are trusted voices in communities to make clear. And those are vaccinated people you're referring to. They make the personal choice to wear the mask in those high rate areas. That's, that, that's, that's not the advice of the CDC at this point in time, so that is not a message we are conveying to okay, people. Dr. Walensky said today that it can be a personal choice for of the course. vaccinated. Of course, it can be. And some people make that decision because they are immunocompromised, because uh, they have family members, because they just want an extra layer of protection, and we should all uh, respect that. But it is not proactive guidance that the CDC is providing. Last night, the president said you're not going to get COVID if you have these vaccinations. Why did he say that when that is not what the science says? Well, what the science says is that 97 percent of hospitalizations are people who are unvaccinated. So yes, there are uh, cases of individuals who are vaccinated, to be absolutely clear, who, uh, who do have gotten COVID. It is a very small percentage and a small number of people. And those cases, vast, vast, vast majority are asymptomatic and they have, uh, they have minor symptoms, which means uh, that you are largely protected. That was the point he was trying to make last night. Go ahead. Thank you. About the vice president's trip, why is it then uh, that when the vice president is asked if she has plans to visit the border, she says we've been to the border even though she has not as vice president. Well, as the vice president, she does speak for uh, the actions of the people in the administration. She certainly helps oversee. I expect that sometimes she may go to the border, Peter, but as you know, what her focus has been, what the assignment is specifically, is to work with leaders in the Northern Triangle. She's on a trip doing exactly that, exactly what the president asked her to do. And as we understand it, though, her main focus is to try to address the root causes of migration, did somebody decide here that it would not be helpful for her to go to the border and talk to people who just migrated here? Well, again, I think that uh, at some point she may go to the border. We'll see. But she's in the Northern Triangle now to have discussions with leaders, with uh, community leaders, with civil society leaders, uh, with the embassy about how we can work together. And obviously she's uh, made a couple of announcements already, probably more to come before she comes back to the United States. And she described, though, that you said she might go to the border. She described a trip to the border yesterday as a grand gesture. Why? Uh, look, Peter, again, I think her focus of this trip is on meeting with leaders, having a discussion about how to address corruption, how to address the root causes, how to work together to address humanitarian challenges in these countries. Uh, that's exactly what she's doing on the ground, and I'm sure she'll report back to the president when she returns. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jen. First, does the president agree with Dr. Fauci that it's too soon to tell if people are going to be able to gather for Christmas? Well, the president relies on CDC guidelines, uh, and they have not changed their guidelines about who can gather together, those who are vaccinated. Uh, but we leave it to them if they need to change their guidelines based on where the pandemic sits. Thank you. Uh, following up on something that you just said, you said that the president's going to have a virtual meeting with House progressives to talk about how this 
Build Back Better package is now going to be smaller than three and a half trillion dollars. But you have been saying that it costs zero. So are you now admitting that the plan does not cost zero, or is it less than zero? Well. Let's let's not dumb this down for the American public here. What we're talking about is uh, how much the top line investments are, which are all paid for. So therefore, it costs zero. No matter what the cost or size of the top line investments are, we have ways to pay for it. So the point is that's important to the American public, all of your viewers too, is that this is not going to cost the American public a dollar. This is going to we're going to pay for this by asking corporations the highest income, so people under four hundred thousand dollars, I should say corporations' highest income to cover the cost of these necessary investments. So just to not tone it down then, does the plan cost nothing or is the plan free? The plan costs nothing for the American people who make less than $400,000. If you think that that companies that paid zero in taxes last year, uh, 50 of the top companies should continue to pay zero in taxes, we're happy to have that and debate. And just one more, uh, Jen, thank you. Uh, a group of activists followed Senator Kirsten Sinema into a ladies' room screaming about the Build Back Better plan yesterday. The president said today, I don't think they're appropriate tactics, but it happens to everybody, and it's part of the process. He is an expert on the process. Has he ever been chased into a restroom by well, activists? Well, let, let me be clear here, because I think the context of what happened here is very important. Um, and Senator Sinema put out a statement this morning. So as she said, and I would reiterate from here, the protection of the freedom to protest, to speak out, and to criticize is fundamental to our democracy. The president believes that. Maybe he shorthanded it, but he wanted to make that clear this morning. What happened this weekend was that her classroom, her students, uh, and, and the safe and intellectually stimulating environment she's worked to create during the years she's t of teaching at, at ASU were, was breached. That's inappropriate and unacceptable. And I think the context of what happened here is important, despite the fact that, of course, we stand for, the president stands for, the fundamental right of people to protest, to object, to criticize, uh, as they often do outside of the gates of the White House. So does the White House condemn these protesters who chased her into the restaurant? I just said it was inappropriate and unacceptable. Well, I think that well, pretty much. Not to do that again. I think that's pretty clear that they shouldn't uh, they shouldn't uh, uh, breach the, the classroom and make the students Students feel like their privacy, their intellectually stimulating classroom, uh, and their time as students in college is being uh, broached upon. Thank you, Jen. A few uh, on immigration really quick. Merrick Garland was asked yesterday if illegal entry at the border should remain a crime, and he said, I haven't thought about that question. Does President Biden believe that illegal entry at the border should remain a crime moving forward? Well, I, I think he was at, being asked as uh, the Attorney General, the future Attorney General. I think he's looking to head to be confirmed uh, of the United States. And if he wants to make considerations independently, he can certainly do that. Uh, but the President's spoken to this, and we believe in abiding by our laws. As you know, there, of course, is a process underway at the Department of Homeland Security to, uh, re, uh, to take a fresh look at prioritization uh, and who uh, is detained and who is sent back home. Uh, so that is something happening from the Department of Homeland Security. But uh, again, if he's going to lead an independent Justice Department, and it's his prerogative to take a look at uh, you know, any policies under their purview. And to that point, why is the Biden administration reopening a temporary facility for migrant children in Texas? Well, um, first, uh, the policy of this administration, as you all know, but just for others, is not to expel unaccompanied children who arrive at the border. Uh, and the process, how it works, is that uh, Customs and Border Control uh, con uh, continue to transfer unaccompanied children to the HHS Office of Refugee Resettlement. That can take a couple of days. I just want to give this context so people need to understand the process. But because of COVID-19 protocols, uh, the like social distancing requirements, the capacity of existing Office of Refugee Resettlement Shelters has been significantly reduced because, of course, you can't have a child in every bed. Um, there needs to be spacing, and we abide by those spacing to protect the kids um, who are um, living in those facilities for a short period of time. And to ensure the health and safety of these kids, HHS took steps to open an emergency facility to add capacity 
where these children can be provided the care they need while they are safely before they are safely placed with families and sponsors. So it's a temporary reopening during COVID-19. Our intention is very much to close it, but we want to ensure that we can follow COVID, state, COVID protocols uh, as we uh, as we as unaccompanied minors come into the United States. But it's the same facility that was open for a month in the Trump administration, summer 2019. That is when Joe Biden said. Under Trump, there have been horrifying scenes at the border of kids being kept in cages. And Kamala Harris said, uh, basically, babies in cages is a human rights abuse being committed by the United States government. So how is this any different than that? We very much feel that way. Uh, and well, the, these are facilities. Let me, be, let me be clear here. One, there's a pandemic going on. I'm sure you're not suggesting that we have children right next to each other uh, in ways that are not COVID safe, are you? I'm suggesting that Kamala Harris said that this facility, putting people in this facility, was a human rights abuse committed by the United States government. And Joe Biden said, under Trump, there have been horrifying scenes of border uh, at the border of kids being kept in cages. Now, it's not under Trump, it's under Biden. This is not kids being kept in cages. This is, this is kids, this is a facility that was opened that's going to follow the same standards as other HHS facilities. It is not a replication, certainly not. The, that's, that is never our intention of replicating the immigration policies of the past administration. But we are in a circumstance where we are not going to expel unaccompanied minors at the border. That would be inhumane. That is not what we are going to do here as an administration. We need to find places that are safe under COVID protocols for kids to be, where they can have access to education, health and mental services, consistent with their best interests. Our goal is for them to then uh, be transferred to families or sponsors. So this is our effort to ensure that kids are treated or not clo in close proximity and that we are abiding by the health and safety standards that uh, the government has been set out. Just quickly on climate, mm -hmm. uh, last week the climate envoy John Kerry said that there are only nine years left to save the world from the effects of climate change. Does President Biden share that assessment, nine years? I don't have a new timeline to, to give you from here. I can confirm for you, though, that the president agrees with former Secretary Kerry that it's a crisis, uh, that time is of the essence. We need to act quickly, uh, and that's why climate is a key part of his agenda. Go ahead. Uh, 